that makes you, you? This is a question that philosophers, poets, and other deep thinkers have been grappling with for ages. Some would say that we are our minds or our bodies. Others would argue that the essence of us is contained in our memories or the actions we choose to take. Now, I'm an evolutionary biologist, so you might wonder what I can add to this conversation. I'm a little bit hurt by you thinking that, because evolutionary biologists are deep thinkers too. And we tend to think that our interactions, both past and present, with other organisms are also shaping who we are. So I want to share that biological perspective with you today. Forty years ago, the famous cosmologist Carl Sagan said, you are made of a hundred trillion cells. We are, each of us, a multitude. He was making the point that our existence relies on the exquisite coordination of these hundred trillion cells. Cells with very different and highly specialized jobs, like transporting oxygen, sending messages to and from your brain, or protecting you from the outside environment. These different teams of cells are essentially cooperating to make you, you. If we look at the size of those different teams of cells, we learn that each of us are essentially human-shaped bags of blood. A full 84% of all of your cells are red blood cells. But that's just if we look at human cells. If we look at all cells, it turns out that none of us is mostly human. We are, in fact, mostly bacteria. It's been estimated that in a reference woman, we can call her for the sake of argument, Nicole, that there are more than twice as many bacterial cells as human cells. And the same is roughly true for you, too. They colonize nearly every surface on and in our bodies. They're on our skin and our teeth, in our airways, and most abundantly, in our guts. So Carl Sagan was right and Carl Sagan was wrong. You are a multitude of cells, but only half of that multitude is human. So what's that other half doing? Is it also playing a role in shaping who we are? You may already know that these bacteria do many jobs for us, like helping us digest our food. We're probably more used to thinking of bacteria as bad guys, the root cause of things like ear infections or food poisoning. But the good guys I'm talking about also help defend us. The mere fact that there are so many of them taking up so much space means that it's hard for these bad guys to invade our bodies. Now, this sounds great for us, and frankly, we would have a hard time existing if it weren't for these bacteria doing all of these jobs. But they're not doing it for us. Bacteria are fierce competitors, extracting resources from within us and protecting those resources. This competitive nature has been exploited already by medicine, and not just in pleasant-sounding ways like taking probiotics, but in less pleasant-sounding ways like fecal transplants. Now, after that talk you heard this morning, I hope there's no ambiguity in what I mean by this emoji here. <laughs> Fecal transplants are what they sound like, taking the gut bacteria of a healthy person, which you can get from their poo, and putting it in a sick person. This has become a real clinical option for treating infections with the bacteria Clostridium difficile. This bacteria is so hard to treat with drugs that biologists normally deep thinking and also creative, gave this bacteria a name that translates to difficult rods. <laughs> now, difficult rod infections actually frequently occur after people have already taken drugs for some other reason, and their bacterial defenses have been depleted. Fecal transplants are the gut equivalent of military reinforcements. OK, so it's clear that these bacteria are cooperating at a basic level to help you function. But it turns out that the structure of our bacterial communities, who's there and in what ratio, also influences a bunch of physical traits as well. And one of the best studied examples is weight. If you look at the bacterial communities in obese people and compare them with slim people, they're really different. If you put an obese person on a diet, their gut communities change. In the lab, you can keep mice that have no bacterial colonists of their own. If you do a fecal transplant from an obese mouse, the recipient mouse puts on a lot of weight. But if you do a fecal transplant from a slim mouse, you get no such weight gain. There's actually anecdotal evidence of this happening in people, too. A case where there was a patient with a life-threatening infection, 
She received a fecal transplant from an overweight relative. She cleared her infection, but experienced sustained weight gain. So you can imagine if we could get this effect, the opposite effect rather, from taking the gut bacteria from a slim person, then we might find that the next miracle pill for weight loss is made out of poo. <laughs> in any case, it's clear that these bacteria are playing a role quite literally in shaping us. Okay, so maybe you're thinking, fine, 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 I'm a multitude of cells of different origin, but the true me is contained in my genome, in my human cells. To that, I would say, first of all, are you trying to impress the evolutionary biologist by bringing up genetics? <laughs> and secondly, yes, that totally works. Let's talk about genetics. <laughs> Most of those human cells in you, those red blood cells, contain no DNA. You might be surprised to hear this. These cells have no nucleus, which is where your other cells contain your genetic code. But even if we put that little issue aside and focus only on the cells that do contain your DNA, you may be surprised to hear where some of it comes from. A full 8% of your genome is stretches of DNA that used to be in viruses. A key feature of some viruses is that they hijack the machinery in host cells, your cells, to copy their DNA. They do this by embedding their DNA inside the genome in a host cell. Then the host cell goes about copying its own DNA and inadvertently produces a new virus in the process. Now, sometimes a virus can get into a really important cell, like an egg or a sperm. And if fertilization happens, the resulting offspring will carry that viral DNA in every one of its cells. Now, viral DNA, like all DNA, is subject to mutations which means that some copies of this DNA might be so different that it can no longer make new viruses. Now, if you have both of these steps occurring, getting mutated viral DNA inside, say, an egg, then that DNA can be passed down through the generations. And evidently, this has happened a lot of times in the past because our genomes are littered with viral DNA. Now, just like our bacterial colonists, these viral relics can sometimes be helpful. And during pregnancy is one of those times. A fetus, much like a virus, has different DNA from its mother, at least partially different, which means that the proteins on the surface of the fetal cells are also different from its mother. The mother's immune system might recognize the fetus as a foreign invader and then try to attack it because of this. Now, viruses have evolved clever tricks of avoiding detection by immune systems. For example, building a protective layer out of the host's own cells. You can think of this as kind of like a cloaking device. At some point in our distant evolutionary history, these cloaking device genes, left over from some virus, were borrowed by fetuses to perform the same trick, building a protective layer out of the host's own cells, or in this case, the mother's own cells. You may have heard of this cloaking device. It's called the placenta. And without these formerly viral genes, it's possible that none of us would be here right now. Okay, so now you know that you are actually more bacteria than human, and you're also a little bit virus. <laughs> but maybe you're thinking, I've totally missed the point. Uh, what makes you you is not the stuff of which you consist. What makes you you is your thoughts, your actions, your desires, and those are all determined by you, right? So it turns out maybe? <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to Toxoplasma gondii, toxo for short. Now, this parasite, much like many humans, has an unhealthy obsession with cats. <laughs> Inside a cat's intestines is the only place this parasite will reproduce, which I guess is a bit of a different kind of obsession than most cat people, I assume. <laughs> now, sometimes this parasite can get into other animals like rodents where it can't reproduce. But all is not lost for the parasite, as you'll soon see. The rodent that you'll see in this video in a second is probably infected with toxo. There he is. Wait for it. <laughs> this is called fatal feline attraction. Toxo-infected rodents are actively attracted to cats, you know, this animal that would normally tend to eat these rodents. Even the cat was confused about how easy that was. 
Now this ill-advised behavior of toxo-infected rodents is clearly beneficial to the parasite and is quite likely a consequence of the parasite manipulating its host. It can do that because toxo gets into the brain of mammals. Only a few parasites can do this. Once it's there, it helps make dopamine, which is a chemical that influences movement and emotions. So this parasite has direct access to the behavioral control center, the brain, and it knows how to operate the equipment. And it's not just in rodents. Here in Canada, about one in four of us, one in four, has been exposed to toxo. Now, most of us will have cleared up this infection without even noticing, but when researchers have looked closely, they found strong associations between infection and behavior. So toxo-infected people are less conscientious and have slower reaction times. Perhaps as a consequence, they're more than twice as likely to get into car accidents. Toxo-infected males are more likely to disregard rules, and infected females are apparently more outgoing. This is usually where I add a joke about how clearly I'm infected with toxo, because I'm just so <laughs> outgoing. How the parasite could generate these effects, or if they are beneficial for the parasite, is not clear. But what is clear uh, is, just as in the case of the toxo-infected rodent, infection seems to be influencing behavior of humans, these things that we think are intrinsic to us. Now, maybe toxo is a special case. It can get into our brains, Meanwhile, those bacteria I was talking about, many of them are relegated to our guts, which, as you can see from my two-scale diagram, is rather far from our behavioral control center. So how could those bacteria influence our behavior? Well, it turns out they actually have a direct line. This is called the vagus nerve. It stretches from your brain into your gut and can send signals back and forth. Bacteria seem to be using this line. In the lab, if you feed mice a probiotic, uh, giving them a particular bacteria, it changes their response to a stress test. In this really cool experiment, researchers took mice and put them in pools of water to see how long the mice would swim before needing to be plucked out. Mice given the probiotic would swim for longer and showed less stress than mice who were fed a normal diet. But if researchers blocked signals from being able to travel along this nerve, then the probiotic had no effect. So, messages from the gut seem able to alter moods, persistence, and motivation. Now, obviously, it would be amazing if bacteria would reliably make me both more calm and a better endurance swimmer. But as an evolutionary biologist who spends her days thinking from the perspective of microbes, I'm not convinced that their influence is always going to be so positive. Remember, these bacteria are in a struggle for survival against each other and our immune systems. Sometimes we make it harder for them, for example, by doing juice cleanses or starting the keto diet, and in the process, depriving them of essential nutrients. Or maybe we have to take antibiotics for some reason, and then our bacterial army becomes victims of friendly fire. We do all sorts of things that are good or fine or okay for us, but challenge the survival of the organisms living on and in us. And even though they're small, there's no reason to think that they would be passive participants in this relationship. If they can influence their likelihood of surviving, they will. That influence might be subtle, like those days you have an unexpected craving for cherry pie or can't stop eating salty snacks. It's possible that you really do just love chips, but that could be a subset of your bacteria essentially demanding particular nutrients that benefit them or suppress their competitors. There's this one study in humans that suggests that chocoholics have different gut bacteria than people who are chocolate indifferent. I love this expression, chocolate indifferent. Like, who are these monsters? <laughs> Now, that data is correlational, and that study was funded by Nestle, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> but there are supportive data from experiments in mice that show that gut bacteria really do influence food choices of individuals. Beyond eating habits, there's been a growing body of work that's finding links between gut bacteria and mood disorders. Clinical trials are happening right now, including here in Toronto, to find out if fecal transplants offer useful treatment for mental health issues, too. Now, the case seems clear with eating preferences, 
But it's not obvious why altering our moods or influencing our actions would, in general, be good for bacteria. But I think that's because we're not used to thinking from their perspective about what is good for them. What makes them thrive and when do they flourish? Is our gut the best place for them? Or like Toxo that finds itself in a rat instead of a beloved cat, would some of these bacteria prefer to be elsewhere? The answers to these questions are important because they'll help us to understand the extent to which our interests, our actions, our moods, and our desires align with the interests of our bacteria. When these interests don't align, there will be conflict. And we can expect that these so-called good bacteria will try to influence the resolution of that conflict in ways that benefit them over us. Now, what I think this all means is, not only are you a few hundred trillion cells, half of which are not human, but your mind, your body, your actions, and your moods are influenced by the independent interests of those hundred trillion cells. Now, I, while you might find that alarming, I think it's kind of amazing. You see, philosophers, poets, and other deep thinkers have been grappling for ages with the questions of why humans show weakness of will, what it means to be of two minds, and why we are frequently internally conflicted. Evolutionary biology suggests answers here and also sheds new light on the questions I started with. What you are, who you are, and what you do may be the confluence and consequence of a diversity of interests, most of which we aren't even aware of and don't yet understand. Put another way, we are, each of us, a compromise. Thank you.